common pools. And there's 50 BTC, there's BitArena, BitCash. BTC Guild is currently the largest Bitcoin pool. The one I personally use is, uh, let's see here, Slush's pool, mining.bitcoin.cz. And you can see in gigahashes, these are the uh, amount of processing power that they have. And actually, this hasn't been updated for a while. Uh, these figures are not right at all. They're, uh, there's considerably more power entering the uh, Bitcoin ecosystem than, uh, than what's being listed here. And that's to be expected because ASICs and FPGAs have entered. But anyway, the probability that any one of these people is going to win by a brute force alone is proportional to how much work that they put in. So BTC Guild statistically is going to win more often than let's say Slush. So let's go ahead and take a look at blockchain. And it's telling us who's won. And you'll see BTC Guild, BTC Guild, BTC Guild, BTC Guild, BTC Guild, Slush. Okay, and then 50 BTC. And we see that they have lots more processing power than Slush does. So just even looking at a couple of blocks, we can see that uh, we can see that this is indeed a uh, a good breakdown, and so for participating in a pool, you are uh, you will receive a share of the work you've done. So when Slush finally does win a block of coins, he remembers the pool remembers who's done the most work, and the majority of uh, the coins are given to whoever's done the most work, and it trickles its way down. So I'm currently mining with two graphics cards, a 7950 and a 7950 and I'm getting about $200 a month worth of Bitcoins. And I have some ASICs on the way, which are going to considerably increase my workload, and that will earn me several thousand dollars a month if the market rate continues to stay around $115. And we'll discuss the market price in uh, our speculation lecture. So if you wish to participate in a mining pool, one thing I'll warn you about, and I'll put it in bold red, is there is no notion of contracts in this world. It's kind of like the Wild West. The pool operator is the person who shall receive the Bitcoins first. It is the pool operator's sole decision to go ahead and allocate these Bitcoins out to people. So things like BTC Guild and uh, Slush's pool, for example, they've been around for some time. People trust them. I trust them. I've been doing business with them for several years. Uh, they're not going to screw you. But some new pool operator, some pool operator you've never heard of, could conceivably just wake up one day and say, all the Bitcoins I've won, I am going to keep. Poo on you guys. So sorry. Okay? So you have to make sure that you trust the pool operator before you do any business with them, i.e. share your computer. All right, now let's go ahead and discuss how to set up a mining client. Let's say for the sake of the argument, you've listened to all of this and you say, Charles, it's a really cool idea. I think I can make a little bit of money because I got a nice powerful graphics card in my computer. How do I actually mine? You've told me what mining is, what mining is used for, blah, blah, blah. But how do I actually mine? Well, you mine by using a mining client. There is one that's created by the Bitcoin um, Open Source Foundation, but it's hard to use. So there's a new client that's been out for a little bit called GUI Miner. And it's really, really easy to use. Just go ahead and download it, save it. And I actually have a copy of GUI Miner running. And you can see it's right now connected to Slush's pool. And even though I'm getting a, a, a slightly reduced hash rate as a result of recording this video, I'm actually mining Bitcoins while talking to you guys. And I'm mining at the rate of 400 and uh, right around 440, 450 bit, uh, mega hashes per second. And this is connected directly to Slush's pool. Slush is keeping a record of all the computations that I'm doing for his pool. And when uh, they get a block of coins after a couple of uh, verifications, Slush actually sends these coins straight to my Bitcoin wallet. And uh, I've been doing this for quite some time. So GUI Miner is really easy to download. It's really easy to configure. Uh, you just basically download it. You don't even have to install it. You just open up the zip folder and then you'll go ahead and put in your username and your password for whatever pool you're associated with. And there are many pools as you can see that are supported by the client. Okay, and let me show you um, what my pool looks like. Let's see. All right, so uh, let's see, slush Bitcoin. 
mining CZ. I never can remember the URL. Okay, so this is right here what the slush mining pool looks like. You just sign up for free. Uh, he explains everything you need to know, and you can also actually send slush an email on his site with uh, or talk to him with live support. He has every incentive to help you configure your Bitcoin mining client because it gives him more processing power. So I'd highly recommend using Slush or Bitcoin Miners Guild. It, uh, BTC Guild has a slightly better web interface. Their fees are a little higher though. Okay. Um, I would only recommend mining currently if you have an AMD graphics card and I'd recommend you check the hardware list to get an idea of what your mining rate will be. The 7950 is one of the best graphics cards on the market right now. It cost me $300 when I purchased it and therefore it's giving me pretty good hash rates. But um, even if you have an expensive NVIDIA graphics card, for example the GTX 680, which is a very expensive, very powerful card, due to architectural designs, decisions that um, NVIDIA made, the NVIDIA card isn't so good for doing things like raw hash computations. Um, there are complex technical reasons for this. It doesn't mean the GTX 680 is like a, a worse graphics card than an AMD card. They're just architecturally different and it turns out that the AMD cards are a little bit better for mining. In some cases they're twice or three times as fast as their NVIDIA counterparts. Although AMD cards are slower in certain respects for other computations like tessellation, for example. But that's not used with Bitcoin making. So I'd only recommend mining if you um, have an AMD graphics card and your graphics card is relatively new. 5000 series or 6000 series are better. And please check the hardware list that I provided to go ahead and see what your hash rate is going to be. Then what I'd recommend doing is go ahead... Oh, I guess I already had a link to Slush's pool in here. Uh, go ahead and check out the Bitcoin mining calculator that we had in the uh, prior slide and just kind of get an idea of what your return is going to be. And you, you should factor in power. To mine effectively, you're going to have to leave your computer on basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can have a little bit of downtime, but whatever downtime you have is less money in the bank. Um, so just make sure that you're actually making money uh, you're not actually spending all of your profits on power. Uh, so right now as it stands, your hash rate should be around 400 to 500 mega hashes. If it's not in that area, you'll probably per watt lose money just paying for the power for your cart. Okay, now let's go ahead and briefly discuss the future of mining. Over time, mining will become the domain of large entities with highly specialized equipment and well-developed skills. As of right now, because the Bitcoin is very new, it's very well distributed, basically it's just a bunch of people leaving their computers on at night. But we've already seen electrical engineers, software experts, people who really know what they're doing, getting into this industry and building very special, very unique hardware specifically to do the kinds of math necessary for that proof of work problem that uh, Satoshi designed in the initial Bitcoin protocol. This basically means if you're one of the small miners, you can't do this forever unless you start acquiring some of this highly specialized equipment. Most of the equipment will be, most of the mining will be profitable uh, if the Bitcoin continues to increase in value. It's only going to be profitable if the Bitcoin continues to increase in value. Uh, miners are very receptive to this. And actually, it's kind of an interesting uh, so, a sociological effect, an economic effect. If mining becomes less profitable, less people do it, less power overall in the uh, Bitcoin uh, ecosystem, and which basically means that for that difficulty factor, block generation starts becoming more than every 10 minutes. As a result, the difficulty factor actually scales down which means it's easier to make bitcoins and therefore mining becomes more profitable per mega hash. You see, so this is a way how the system balances. If the, if bitcoins become much more profitable, more miners come in. More miners mean that we're starting to generate blocks faster, therefore the difficulty ratchets up. Uh, and if the value goes down, uh, mining becomes less profitable and therefore the difficulty scales down. However, that said, uh, because of the amount of new entrance into the mining spectrum, uh, the Bitcoin has to appreciate in value for mining to continue to be profitable, especially with the investment of highly specialized equipment. It's a really good crowd signal. In finance and in, in other fields, we tend to use crowd signals. Basically, we ask, what is the mass doing? What is the mob doing? What is the wisdom of the crowd? Now, in some cases, the crowd is wrong, and they're irrational, and they make big, bad mistakes. In other cases, the crowd can be very, very right. 
for that said, a lot of people who make decisions to buy hardware, specialized hardware to mine Bitcoins, have made that decision because they believe, number one, the Bitcoin is here to stay, but more importantly, number two, that the value of the Bitcoin is going to be above some sort of return value threshold. And because millions of dollars have been invested in new hardware to mine Bitcoins, especially over the last two years with FPGAs and ASICs, uh, it's a very good signal that uh, mining is going to become even more profitable. Um, and regardless of the block award, as long as transactions are done in Bitcoins, miners will receive Bitcoins from verification fees. I'll discuss this a little bit. So when you send money from one person to another person, so from you to your friend Bob, let's say, or when I sent money from uh, myself to myself, the wallet on my computer to the wallet uh, in the cloud, I actually had to pay a small transaction fee. What is this transaction fee? What is this verification fee? Well, I mentioned that a block is a queue of transactions. Whether my transaction is in that queue or not is entirely up to the miners who verify blocks. Now, you as a miner may say, hey, wait a minute, if you want to get your transaction verified before the other people, pay me a little bit of money, i.e. a transaction fee. So these transaction fees aggregate are what determine who gets their transactions verified first, usually in order of who pays the most. So if you have a very high value, very large transaction that uh, you'd like to get verified, generally people will pay a small fee like 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 bitcoins or something like that to make sure that that transaction gets verified very quickly. If you have a very small transaction for 0 0.001 bitcoins, for example, some cases, uh, my, if my, the transaction volume is high, it may take several hours for my transaction to be verified because you know, the transaction's smaller than you know, a reasonable fee, so usually I can get it done. That said, every transaction inevitably will be verified regardless of what it is, but if you pay nothing, no transaction fee, it could sometimes even take days to verify a transaction. As a miner, whoever wins the block wins all the transaction fees associated with the block. So let's say for the sake of the argument that we stop making Bitcoins, as long as there's commerce with the Bitcoins and thousands of transactions being done per block, those transactions aggregate together will still be somewhat profitable for people to mine. So mining will always be profitable as long as first the Bitcoin is somewhat valuable and also um, the hardware cost plus the uh, power cost to run the hardware is lower than the transaction fees. Okay, so that's all I have for you on uh, the mining lecture. This is a very complex topic. Um, what you should really try to take away from this lecture is Mining is just a tool that was invented to replace the notion of a central bank as the issuer of new money and also to verify transactions that have occurred. To run a decentralized currency and make sure that everything's legitimate, everybody's on the same page, you need some sort of computational mechanism to do so. And Satoshi's solution is the one you see with these proofs of work. It's pretty amazing. Proofs of work first started appearing actually back in the 90s when people were considering ways of preventing spam as a, as a curious historical footnote. And one of the solutions was, how about we make a computer before it sends a, an email do a computation that takes several seconds? Well, you know, if you're sending your email, you wouldn't really care if it took an extra five seconds to send your email. But if you're a spammer, you would have to send several million emails every, you know, several minutes to go ahead and make that worth your time. Unfortunately, you know, if you're sending, let's say, 50 emails, and it's taking two seconds each, that's 100 seconds, so it's a little over a minute and a half to go ahead and send. Think about how long it would take to send a million emails. And this was kind of a, a way of dealing with spam. And it was proposed, I think it was called Hashcash, and um, many people thought about implementing it. Satoshi obviously read that paper because he took Hashcash and he modified and contorted it and turned it into the Bitcoin system we see today. So it's, it's amazing how something that was never intended for a currency could wind up actually building a distributed peer-to-peer -peer currency. All right, so that's all I have for you on mining. Uh, the next lecture, we'll go ahead and discuss Bitcoin speculation. When we say the Bitcoin is $115, how did we arrive at that price and um, what, what do we need to know about it? And should you trade the Bitcoin? Okay, as always, thank you for listening and have...